Okay, welcome everybody again. Uh, so, this is the third lecture. And last time we finished, well, we uh, left off with uh, defining what a pure dimensional variety was. So let's do some small recall, of, well, quick recall of what we did last time. So we define what the dimension uh, was. Then we define what a purely dimensional uh, variety was. So then, oh, uh, we define what a pure dimension was, meaning that every irreducible component has the same dimension. So that allows us, allow us to define curves, surfaces, and height surfaces. Okay. So the reason why this equidimensional uh, concept is so useful comes from uh, the following fact. I actually don't remember if I uh, started this, but let's state it nonetheless. The fact is, if I can compose uh, if uh, an affine variety, no, an affine subset, so, uh, composes in irreducible components, these are the irreducible components. Then, simply put, its dimension will be well, the supremum of the max. I say it's uh, supremum because it could be infinite, so I might as well Imagine we have a plane, the curve passing through. This should be seen as a two-dimensional affine subset. Alright. Uh, so this is a one. The number two is something uh, concerning co-dimensions. Uh, we can also say that the dimension <laughs> of uh, x is the Supremo of so there are points where this supremo is attained as a co-dimension of the point. Okay. Okay. So this so we arrived at some satisfactory notion of the dimension, and there is a uh, for the hypersurfaces, at least for uh, hypersurfaces, hypersurfaces in a fine end space, there's a very satisfactory result. So, okay. establish. Uh, okay. So, a hypersurface. So, it's just write it like this, x, and we can say is given by a single equation. Okay. In other words, I of x is principal ideal. And x is simply put, is simply cut out by this equation. Now, uh, this, let's say, yeah, this is actually uh, linked to the following fact. K of x1 xn 
is an MMT. Right? So a unique factorization domain. Right? And there's a characterization of UFD, UFDs, saying that any prime ideal of height 1 is principal. Hence this statement. I guess you assume that f is not there, not, not there. f is different from z. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's real. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, yeah, but you know, sometimes it kind of goes out. Yeah. Uh, and finally, we define the degree of the hypersurface sets. As simply put, the degree of just that. And if we want a detailed proof of this and how the commutative algebra comes into play, just look at Gatman's lecture notes, uh, 247 and 248. Okay. So, this concludes uh, my intrusion into dimension. We will come back to dimension once we start uh, uh, studying singularities and most notably we will try to come back to the initial intuition that of local coordinate systems around a point and when we see that there are problems to define it like that especially because of singularities but we need a couple of uh, I will need to introduce other concepts in the meantime so <coughs> So, uh, as I mentioned in lecture, uh, in lecture two last week, uh, I mentioned that some function of any map from uh, that we need to, do, to be careful how to be, how we define the maps that preserve structure inside our uh, affine varieties, right? And usually. We need to define a big category. We need objects. I define sub, I define subsets. But we also need morphisms. Okay? So, this third, let's say, chapter, part, I don't recall what it was, uh, will be about. Regular functions. So, and this will allow us to define uh, uh, the morphisms that are the sort of the, the morphism part of our category. Okay. Now, uh, usually for differential uh, geometry or analytic geometry, complex geometry, uh, when you define a smooth map between smooth manifolds, you need an atlas and you need to define, uh, to show that the smoothness condition on each chart, uh, chart yeah, of the atlas. Uh, so this pro these properties are local. And this is kind of the model for our uh, regular mock functions in the fact that we will define them as uh, maps between affine subsets having a local property. So let's take x an affine subset and u. An open subset of this same uh, affine subset. <coughs> so, so a regular uh, functional map, same thing here, on U is a function of, I'll write it F. K, remember, is still our uh, uh, 
base field that it's algebraic closed. So whenever you have a doubt, think of K as being C. Just a fine tradition of K. Such that, so as I said, it does a local property. For all A inside the view, there exists an open neighborhood of A inside the view. Inside of U A, F of P is just equal to G of P over uh, H of P for G and H regular functions on one of the polynomial functions on X and of course. This implicitly means that HP is not zero for all P in the Okay. So uh, uh, we write yeah okay. So we write these uh, regular functions on U. of shift theory to bring us uh, too far the long, uh, so too far uh, the way. So we are just uh, be content with defining uh, the, of the sections of our open of this shift, that's what this B, and uh, that will be a point. So we need to define the regular functions of our open sets. Uh, especially when we need rational functions further along the way. Okay, so I so let's take an example because these things could really uh, be confusing sometimes. So I'll take a quadric surface inside A of four. Okay. So x, t, x, y, z, and t are the let's say coordinates inside of A4. Sometimes you will have people who will actually <coughs> add them in the circle script, just to show that they are these are the coordinates. So on this uh, hypersurface, uh, I set you can set uh, u, which is an open subset, which is the complementary of y and t. So we just look away from these two coordinate axes. Uh, and we define. <coughs> so let's see. Okay, so. So I have a point, which are coordinates x, y, z, and t, and since uh, since on u we either have y is non-zero or t non-zero. We can define these like this. But wait a minute, what happens if both y and t are non-zero? Well, actually, they coincide on the overlaps, uh, on the yeah, on the overlap, since we have this equation. Alright. So uh, yeah, it's 
well defined since for x, y, z, t such that y and t are zero, we have x t is equal to y z. So we just divide by y and by t. So we have x equal zero. But the problem is. Uh, we can't actually extend these uh, definitions beyond uh, beyond these local neighborhood inside of you. We can't uh, since well, we would need to long well, why. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm going to raise this. So let's establish a couple of properties of these regular functions. Uh, do they satisfy some uh, necessary properties? Like, for instance, are they continuous functions? Okay. We, are, we have established last time that this is topology. So, are they continuous functions for this particular topology? Well, let's. Let's show that. Okay, so I have an element just for like the definition of the function. I have the same setup, and I can define actually the following uh, set, which is very similar to the zero locus of a polynomial. We can define the zero locus of a uh, regular function. Okay, so this. Is the set of points in U such that phi of P is equal to C. So very, very simple. Okay, but what is the property of this? Is that is uh, a closed subset in well in U, but we for the induced size allows us to show any regular function is continuous. The way we can uh, actually establish this uh, is by actually equipping K with the Zaleski topology of A1, okay? And this is actually pretty easy to see once we establish this. Zaleski topology of A1 are simply, the closed sets are simply finite. Uh, subsets. So we just need to show that the inverse image of a single term is equal to a closed set, subset of U. But we can translate that by considering simply phi minus a constant, and we just need to show that phi minus the reverse image of a zero is closed. But the reverse image of zero is just the uh, so it's all. Okay. 
Now, there's also a identity principle. Come back to irreducibility. This is the main point. So if x is irreducible, so this makes it an affine variety. Okay, so variety is generally um, reserved for irreducible uh, affine subsets. Okay, and. Let's say that I have a nested set of opens in uh, X and uh, well, I'm using n too many times. But let's say I have two regular functions over U such that P1 over V is equal to P2 over V. So if I, uh, well, not in. So if I restrict two non empty, uh, two regular functions on a non empty uh, sub, uh, on a non empty sub open set, then we actually have equality. And one is actually equal to phi two. So this kind of mirrors the extensions, the extension of polynomial identities principle I mentioned as an application of the irreducibility. Okay. Now, <coughs> okay, so, now that we have this Section. We would like to know a little bit more about the structure of these rings because at the end of the day, these are rings. And for that, we are going to need some a particular set of uh, open subsets. We will need to probe the, uh, the uh, let's say, internal structure of all these regular maps and how they behave by, by restricting our attention to a particular set of opens. These are called the distinguished opens. And they are very important for many, many uses. So, let's uh, x find a subset and f a function, then define v of f as simply the set of points in x such, a, such that f of p e is not zero. So this is the distinguished open subset of f in x. Of these dF. 
Now, uh, since we have x which are affine subsets, so these affine subsets are defined by ideals in k of x, right? k x one x n, and this it happens to be a Noetherian ring. So any ideal is defined by a finite number of equations. So actually, uh, every open is a finite union of these pfs. So any open is of the form, uh, yeah, let's continue. So, uh, okay, all right. Uh, so these are the uh, generators of the ideal defining the complement of you. And this is simply put x tied of v of f1 with k. We already established this from the topology. And then we just take the, the more values. Right? It's just uh, x minus the f1. And this is just the f1. exactly how to uh, work inside this particular sub, uh, subset. that O x of d of f is actually, simply put, uh, a of x localized at f. Now, uh, if you don't know or are not uh, familiar with localization, this just means that this is the set of let's see, fractions. Okay. OG is in A of X, and N is a natural number. So any regular function actually can, uh, can be defined globally on the distinguished open. So this is a non-trivial fact. And this is a rather non-trivial result. It needs to it, it deals a lot with the fact with uh, open covers by distinguished open subsets and uh, defining an algebraic uh, equivalent of partitions of unity. So it's a little bit involved uh, technique. Yeah. Okay, so this is an index. Okay. So in particular, yes, in particular, If I take f equal to 1, the distinguished open is just uh, x itself. And if n localizing by 1 it gives us the original ring. So this is just a of x. So a regular function on an affine is a polynomial function, not just a quotient of two polynomials. Okay. Now, uh, we wonder. Okay. What types of conditions did I need? Well, uh, if k is not equal, to, uh, is not algebraic closed, we can have problems. All right. 
Why can we have problems? Well, if I take 1 over 1 plus x squared, this is inside this particular So this is a regular function on the whole uh, affine line, yet this, this is not a polynomial function. We can prove that it's not a polynomial function. Okay. <coughs> then, so if we stray uh, from these if we stray around uh, from these uh, distinguished opens, sometimes we can have very weird phenomena. So I'll just give an example, which is uh, the pointed origin, the affine plane without the origin. Okay? So we can show that O uh, A2 uh, without the origin, but well, this will be an open subset since uh, closed points are, uh, what, uh, single points are closed points. So we can uh, retract this, this is an open, is actually equal to the same one and they should overlap on the intersection and we uh, we find by just looking at what happens on these ones that the intersection of these things we need to have a polynomial from the beginning so sometimes these things are very weak okay now There's a question? No, no, no. Okay. So, uh, once we have this, if we want, wish to push the analogy with differential geometry a little bit further, we will look at germs of functions. Right? This is all going to be this, if we look at the germs of regular functions, this will give us the local rings around the point. We also call this stocks. Let's so, uh, okay. So if I have x on a fine subset and p a point of x, uh, then the local ring at p is the well. We would need to look to show it at the ring, but it, it's quite uh, it's quite uh, easy to show. It's the ring of germs of regular functions. Okay. Okay, so if we call a jar, we simply put uh, the Golden's class. Okay, so.
So I e the set the equivalence classes of like this, okay? Well, uh, no, it's P, sorry. Is new, okay, open, inside of X. And this is how I write an equivalence class. If I would like uh, to have the pairs, I would just write a parenthesis, not uh, rectangular ones. Okay, and um, U F is equal to B of G, so you have two representants, they are equal. If there exists W, So a neighborhood of P which is smaller than both U and V, such that one well, of the restrictions is well, the restrictions are equal. Okay. You write a string uh, simply OX of P. Okay. Now there's a one, there's a there's also a 2. Okay. So we also can define in a very similar process the function field of x in the case of uh, when x is irreducible. So, 
just as we established the structure of the uh, regular functions over distinguished opens, we can wonder, okay, well, uh, what is the structure of these logarithms? Can I actually uh, show what happens inside of it? And the answer is uh, yes. It is quite possible, very, uh, very interesting result, uh, by the way. So the first remark is that OXP is actually a local ring. So this is why we call it the local ring of P. Where the maximal idea is, I'll write it as a uh, calligraphic M. And sometimes I'll even drop the matrix, which is just uh, the equivalence classes where, well, now I'm using X, so. Okay. And this, uh, the fact that it is uh, uh, actually the value of any uh, germ at the local point is independent of the representative because they always agree on the open label expectation. Zero, and we can invert it. If f of x is not zero, well, let's let's change it a bit the notation. Of it, then <coughs> and if we restrict it. Show that this is a unique maximal idea. No problem. Uh, okay. Now we can go even a little bit further beyond this, and now we need a little bit more localization. So, okay. If I look at the uh, the local ring, well, actually we can obtain it by a very similar process that we obtain the distinguished regular functions. I take a of x and I localize at a very specific idea. So this will be the idea of m of x, not to be confused with this one, this situation. Okay. So remember when we had the Neustadt results, any point is corresponding to a maximal idea. So this corresponds to the maximum idea in X, uh, defining the point X, right? And <coughs> it turns out that we just need to localize the, uh, uh, the coordinate ring at this maximum idea to obtain the local ring, and this is. Well, if you are afraid of localization, just think that this is uh, G over uh, H, okay, where G and H are in the coordinate ring, and of course H of X is non zero. So the localization of the prime is always we invert all the elements not inside the file. Okay. And if you are, uh, if you want to know the basis of localization, you can look at chapter three of Atelier. It's very clear. It establishes how these 
how to define the localization and its uh, its subdomains. Okay. But really, we just need to think of it as fractions, formal fractions uh, inside of uh, the coordinate. Of elements inside the coordinate. And all, I mean, of course, we have all the elementary operations of fractions, uh, just like we learned in middle school. Okay. Okay. So we have a more or less an idea of what these elements represent. And this. And OK. Uh, so these are the remark one, two. So let's finish up with number three remark. If. Uh, so we always. We will always have a certain uh, amount of maps between all these things. They are all related in some canonical way. Uh, so we will have we have the canonical maps. So a of x, we know that this is the global regular functions. Now we can restrict them to a distinguished open. So this is O of x of e of f. So we know that this will be a of x uh, localized at f, right? And this could actually be seen as the this is the canonical map uh, for localization. What does this mean? This means that I, if I take a uh, regular function phi, then th this will simply be the fraction phi over one. Okay. And if we have a regular function of our neighborhood uh, around the point P, so now we suppose that x is inside of P of f. So f of x is not zero. Then we can consider any function, any regular function here, its class in the set of terms. Okay? And this again is a localization map at the maximum line. Okay. So it will take uh, any function here, so g of n over h, it will give us the same fraction inside of that. Okay. Like this. And so these are all canonical, but a, spe a very special case for varieties is, and if x is a variety, so irreducible, we actually have a fourth member in all these uh, canonical maps, which is the function. Okay? The maps, so I'll have all of x, x, this will be all of x. Df. This will give me one for point here, and we can extend this. So remember that uh, basically the in the way we define it, the germs are simply put uh, equivalence classes in the functional field around P. This is what this last map means, and if it is irreducible, then all these maps are in J. So we could, you could actually see that everything is something happening, coming from uh, this place here. And uh, yes, and if we have this, we have a, uh, another presentation here. The function field would then be the ring of fractions of k of x. So this is also localization. What is this localizing? Well, you can consider that we are localizing 
at the ideal of zero, which is a prime ideal since we have an irreducible ring, uh, irreducible uh, variety, sorry. So this is a domain. This is a domain, this is a frag, uh, localization of a domain, and all these maps are inclusions. So, in order to define the morphisms, we will go for this datum of, the, of these things. And this is our this is going to be our definition of morphisms. Okay, so let's see. Okay. There. Well, so let's say we have uh, two affine subsets, x and y, and we have a map between the two. So it's a function for now. We don't really know what happens. Okay, so, okay, I call it. So, so I like to sometimes uh, write the name of the function over the arm like this. So if y is an affine subset, that means that it's inside some, it is the closed set of some a n of k. Right? But this means that f could be seen as something uh, that arrives in A and FK, but whose image happens to be inside of Y. And giving a function from X to A and FK, okay, so giving phi, uh, F, uh, giving, uh, is equivalent to giving. And functions x from a one of k, but this could just be seen as k. So let's think about them without the uh, variety identity. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, passport of variety. It's just drop that, and we just consider it as k. So what do we want here? We will want this to be regular morphisms. And this is the recipe for defining morphisms. <coughs> so let X be a map. Okay. Now, uh, X is a morphism. It is continuous if it, uh, if it is nice. Three words of the time. Continuous and uh, okay. For all open inside Y, uh, we can define. We define that. We find a pullback map. Well, we can find a pullback map from OY of B to 
all x of f minus v. So I take a regular function over v. And I consider f pullback of v. So this is uh, the notation for pullback. But this is simply put, uh, which I always get confused. Uh, v okay, uh, restricted to f of like can define it like that. So what does this mean? This means that f uh, takes regular maps to regular maps. Okay. Yeah. So this is what it means that it preserves the structure uh, from one variety to the other. The idea is always to be able to relate uh, the two structures via these maps. So for the second condition, why should we insert can? Isn't it that we just define it in this way? Uh, no, well it means it's because this is completely determined by f. Yeah, that right? is there. Yes, but if f is something very wild, very pathological, then this would not be well defined. This could be, uh, yeah, it, it, if I take a regular function if, and if I precompose it uh, with uh, f, then it could not, it could be something else and not regular anymore. So this is actually a condition. The, the way I write it, or rather, uh, I should the, the way I should actually uh, say is that uh, this map is well defined, rather, because it will take a regular function and it will pull it back to a continuous function, which, if it is regular for all f for all phi, then it will be homogeneous. Possibly go wrong. So you have uh, phi on the other sides in the yeah. regular function, then you just compose with something that is continuous. Yeah. So it takes you into the open set. So yeah, but this is just a continuous function. Yeah. If uh, f is something that is not, uh, well, I'm a little bit, yeah, let's go back to this. Okay. If, it's, if the f is not given by, let's say, polynomial functions, Portions of polynomial functions, then this could be something that is not polynomial functions. So, for instance, consider uh, sinusoid, uh, yeah, um, uh, trigonometric functions, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. if you compose a polynomial function with a trigonometric function, then you won't be a polynomial. Function. Okay. So this is the kind of like that. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So this is a definition that once we go back a little bit more into the algebraic underpinning of this, we'll see how uh, how this is actually very good. It's actually the same intuition behind this. Okay, but. Let's just define what an isomorphism is. So that we can actually have a way of identifying spaces now. Uh, so, is morphism F on X and Y that has an inverse? 
So morphism G Y X such that F G is the identity of Y and G equals back to the identity of X. And this is uh, well we will see a counterexample uh, just a little bit beyond that. This, is, this does not mean that it's bijective uh, and morphism. You could have here a morphism which is uh, bijective, but it, which is not an isomorphism. And we'll see uh, why that can happen later on. Okay. Well, the main. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, okay. So let's establish some quick properties of these, uh, how we handle these. Uh, we have uh, continuity. With, we never mentioned continuity until now. You think it's something uh, that would come from this structure, but we needed continuity because if B was an open, we needed that this would be an open as well. Okay. And F minus one. Okay. The second part would be to see that uh, we have it's the definition is compatible with uh, composition. Right? Uh, is stable under composition. So what does this mean? It means that you have two maps which are composable. Uh, then the composition is also is amorphous. Okay. Uh, okay, and what? Now we could also work a little bit more on the geometry inside of X, and this is where I we extend the category of objects we are going to study to quasi-affine. So, okay, we can extend the uh, category of objects and, well, uh, the three points here is just to say that we won't need to, do, to define any other maps because the regular maps will be uh, compatible with this. So, uh, what are these objects? We call it quasi affine uh, subset. Is an open subset of an affine subset. Subsets with variety if it is irreducible. Right. Uh, is a fine, uh, quasi fine variety in the affine subsets 
Kernstorm in series. There's also something we call is open summarity of quasi open uh, variety. So we reduce, we are considering irreducible polygonal spaces. Uh, is is an open subset of separate. Since the definition is local, yeah. since the definition is local, that means uh, we only need to look at neighborhoods around points. We can always consider all small neighborhoods so that we can be inside the quasi right? Okay, but. Just a terminology to establish the following theorem. Well, so, theorem. So, my subset of the affine subset X. Okay. So, this is where I needed to introduce the concept of quasi affine. So, just like on the blackboard that I erased a couple of minutes ago, uh, we will be able to define uh, the morphisms from U to another, uh, to another uh, subset. And we now can finally characterize. Let's see. Okay. So I will. Just like in our introductory discussion, why uh, define subsets? And I also want to, pre uh, to uh, establish here what the end space is. 
Uh, sorry for the interruption, but what's no. the statement of the theorem? Oh no, I'm just, this is just defini the defining terms. This will be so the, the, the statement. Of the thing, okay. So morphisms uh, from U to Y uh, are just uh, let's see how I put it. Yeah. Maps X U in phi of so let's give a name here uh, X. So coordinate wise, they are given by regular functions. This is what the statement of the term is. Well, phi i is just. O uh, C O U of uh, well technically it's just right. okay. right. So this is just to say that uh, the definition I gave with uh, the regular functions a core is compact is the same as the one intuitively. Okay. And uh, there should be a part one and part two. Oh, I'm sorry, this, there should be a part one and a part two. Because this is relatively easy to establish, we just consider the uh, coordinate functions and x and we pull it back. And we see that they are necessarily going to be the fed if he adds. Now, uh, the more non trivial part is uh, the following. Uh, so we, all, we still keep x and y this time, but now we just look at the whole x and y, not just the okay? And this is actually, there is actually a, uh, a nice homomorphism. So here we have morphisms of uh, a fine subsets, okay? So I don't really give much of a name other than just more morphisms. But here we have morphisms of K algebras between the coordinate rings. And this map, now it has uh, several properties, okay? So how do we uh, uh, define it? Well, we are going to take a morphism V of x to y, and we can actually establish its pullback morphism. So remember that when you have a regular function, you can you can take regular functions to regular functions by via pullback operation. So what is this? This is going to be a pullback from O y. And I just take from regular functions of the whole set <coughs> to here we have the regular functions of x on this uh, inverse image, but the inverse image of the whole uh, target is just the uh, domain. This is just all x of x. Right? Okay. And uh, well, what are these rings? Well, we have established that uh, this is a Y, and this is a X, the coordinate X. So, this is how we build this correspondence. And the fact is that this is a bijection, right? It is Bijection. So, co x and y are affine subsets. Okay. Now it has some uh, several uh, properties. Now. So, 
one of the mine, uh, one half, uh, one wish to establish a strong connection between two objects or two uh, types of objects, we would like to have some, what we call functionality. This correspondence is functorial. This can be established at the level of what happens with fullbacks. Uh, let's see. Okay, so if I have, like we said, two composable uh, morphisms like this, then if I consider the composition to still be a, uh, a morphism, so if, what happens if I take the pullback? Well, uh, you can also uh, build this one from the pullbacks of each individual, but in reverse. Okay. So this is uh, to remind that if I have x, y in this order here, here the order is reversed. I have first y then x. This is an arrow reversing uh, uh, functor. It's uh, what we call a contravariant. Don't, if you are not familiar with the category three, just forget and just think arrow reverse. Right? This just means arrow reverse. Okay, it's not such a big deal. But if we have this, we also have that the identity of x is also equal to the identity of a of x. This is very easy. We compose stuff with the identity. So uh, this bijection preserves isomorphism. Preserves isomorphisms. Okay. So this means that we actually have uh, x and y are isomorphic. So x and y are isomorphic if and only if we can establish an isomorphism on the set of coordinates x Example to what I said before. It, well, it's uh, it's not okay anymore. But that uh, counterexample of some sort. Uh, that isomorphisms are not bijective morphisms. Okay. So what does this mean? Well, let's build an example which is relatively easy. So I'll take the affine line on one hand, so I represent it like this, and on the other hand I'll have a uh, cusp. So what does this curve represent? It looks kind of like this, cusp C. And my morphism will be between the two, so I need to raise the right hand side with my maps. So this will be also a nice example to wrap up our intuition of the regular functions. Okay. Well, A1 
we only have, let's say that an element of A1 is just by written D, right? Okay, and the curve C, it's a cusp, but you, as you can see, you need a little bit of two dimensions. This is one dimensional, we need a two, two dimensional environment. So which one? Yeah. And this is inside the plane. We have just like this. And here, the obvious idea would be just to say like this. Okay. So this obviously is a regular map. This is a bond number function. This is by the first point of the previous theorem. This is just saying that the, uh, A1 arrives in the plane, and it is given by point number functions. Uh, which are the only regular functions at A1, and it happens to be inside of C. Because obviously, if I square this and cube this, and there will be. Okay. Uh, so, first point, it is a point. Right? I just. Well, I just. Uh, Gave the main argument. Okay. First of all, okay. So what happens to its pullback? Right. How do we uh, build the pullback? So this is the from. Oh, sorry. No, this is that. Uh, this is phi. So what does uh, what does the uh, pullback look like? Well, the coordinate ring of C. What is what is it? If you remember, it is the set of function of polynomial functions on C. So we take a polynomial function on A2, and restricting it at C amounts to looking modulo it defining the equation. Now it turns out that this uh, ideal is prime. The idea, so obviously, by the proof, that's this is the whole idea of this C. It's not necessarily easy to show, but it's a uh, okay, uh, Let's see, do I have a problem with K? Yeah, so this is the my notation for the base field is sometimes yeah. not. Okay, but what happens on this side? Well, A of A1 is simply equal to k of t. And I am using the same letter for a very specific purpose because this here map will just be t cubed and t squared. So if you know what happens on these coordinates, you know what happens on this and how to define it. Okay. So, uh, this is what happens, happens on the level of the coordinates. But phi is bijective. You can re reasonably see it like this. If you have a point here, t, so this is the curve, this is the origin if you, if you want. This is zero, the origin O. So it lies above the point O, and if I have t here, I can pinpoint the point t, uh, t cubed uh, t squared. Like this. So obviously you can think that this is a bijective map. Right? If uh, if you're not convinced, you just the you just look the inverse is I take x y on c and say that. This is going to be x of y if y is on 0 and 0 otherwise. Okay. But this map will not be regular. Why? This is not an azo And the reason is that if it were an isomorphism, then it would imply that the pullback here would be equally an isomorphism. If it would be, 
then phi star would be uh, bijective. Now, nonetheless, there's a missing element here. We don't have the monomial P. It's not in the image. Then would be subjective among other things. But T is not in the image of V star. So in some sense this is uh, uh, this gives you an idea of why these things don't work out. And in some and this proves that this is more or less well this proves no not in a formal way, but this at least demonstrates visually why this is a the relevant definition of morphism. As you can imagine, this here will be a singularity. And uh, we want to understand the varieties uh, on the algebraic level and to, come to understand at the algebraic level the intimate geometry of these subsets. So this is a very simple style variety, smooth. So it could not be isomorphic to something simple. This is relatively, this is kind of what is shown here. Okay. And what actually we will see uh, next time, we'll see that this map is actually not an, an isomorphism, but a birational morphism. So we will relax a little bit the condition of regularity, and this will turn out that this is Another example of a resolution. Meaning that if we look, uh, it meaning that we will try to preserve as much as we can the geometric structure, but trying to ignore what happens with these uh, singularities. Okay. So, uh, just to wrap up what we discussed. can actually wrap up all the discussion in a relatively fancy uh, vocabulary. Let's see. Uh, uh, we've established Equivalence of categories. This is so. On the one hand, well, as you can imagine, we have defined subsets. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't like to use uh, uh, curly collapse because you know, categories are not really. saying which uh, end space I'm walking inside. Because on the other hand, we have so reduced okay, algebra, uh, algebras of finite type. subset x and I just associate a of x like this and uh, we could construct what we call a quasi inverse meaning that uh, if I start with the reduced k algebra how can I find an affine subset to which it corresponds or at least at uh, modulo isomorphisms 
because this is an inequalities class. It's not an equality or an isomorphism of categories. Uh, constructing the quasi-universe. So take R of reduced algebra so let's say it is generated by one a n and we can set up a map on the binomial at this time We can define the x uh, for any xi, we send it to ai. Now, so this is subjective, okay? And I make j be the kernel. And we can actually say that v of j, which is inside uh, a and fk, is isomorphic x via this morphism. Well, via the quotient of this morphism by the end. So this is, this is uh, let's say, the culminating point of this lecture. I think I'll stop here. Tuesday. Okay. <laughs>